Good morning, everybody. I appreciate y'all keeping up. This is Tuesday morning, and we get to have another conversation with another fantastic person in the world of motorcycle drag racing. And that person is Chris Bostick. Chris Bostick is a good man. I'm glad I know him. Uh, he's always hospitable as I come around with my camera or my mic, and uh, he's always willing to uh, support the sport and uh, be a part of uh, letting everybody know what's going on. Now, he had um, a new suit for Z-Max, and um, that's where I got to meet up with him at. So we're going to have a conversation. But first, let me make sure I remind everybody this, this session is brought to you by Pablo Gonzalez Racing. PG2Racing.com. And you can also find them on Facebook. You can also find them on Instagram. And it's because of Pablo Gonzalez that I was at Z-Max Dragway and got to have this conversation and many more. Um, so please support Pablo Gonzalez Racing, Facebook, Instagram, and on his website. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Pablo. With that being said, let's go have a conversation with Chris Bostic. All right, this is JT. Try and keep up. We have... Chris Bostick. Good morning. How are you doing, sir? Hey, I appreciate you sitting down with me. I'm doing good. Thank you for including me and, and uh, having me be a part of this podcast. I, I'm looking forward to it and looking forward to your continued success and the uh, loyalty of your ever-growing listener base. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Now, it's a, uh, where are we at? May 14th? Yeah. May 14th, Z-Max driveway, driveway. As soon as I learn how to speak, we'll both be okay. Z Max Dragway, North Carolina. So, and um, we're going to be making some noise this weekend. But before we talk about what we might be doing this weekend, let's back it up. Who's sure. Chris Bostick? Oh my gosh, I, uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, a guy like everybody else out there in the world that, that has a dream and a passion of wanting to, to go fast. And I've uh, I've been you know around racing my entire life. My father and his father were actually competitors in the very first national event that NHRA ever had way back in the in the mid 50s. Wow. And so the, the, one of my grandfather's cars was the first dragster to ever run 150 miles an hour through the quarter mile. So I mean it's been in my blood forever, but for whatever reason I gravitated towards motorcycles. I just love motorcycles. So what did so, what did you start out on? Did you start out on motorcycles or did you do cars as well? Well I had, you know, a fast Camaro that we thought was fast. We built up when I was you know, 16 years old, and I had a SS396 El Camino. That was my very first vehicle. Okay. And so I liked those. But my best friend growing up, Donnie Haggard, his parents owned the Suzuki Yamaha uh, Honda dealership, only about three blocks from our house. And so, literally, from the time I was in the fourth or fifth grade. Every day after school, I would be on my bicycle and I'd go and we would just hang out in the showroom at uh, Donnie's you know, cy parents' cycle shop, <laughs> sit on these dirt bikes and mini bikes and dream of you know what may be one day. So, oh wow, so, very cool. Now you made a comment about your about your dad. What was what were they racing back then when they, they started? Raced, uh, what did they start out on? My father had a brand new stock Corvette, so he ran uh, the stock class. Okay. My grandfather ran a, um, it was a Chrysler, had a, a, a Hemi engine in it, and then they had another guy that drove for them that ran a slingshot dragster. What did you start, did you start out helping them? Is that how? Oh, no, no. Um, uh, unfortunately, another first, my grandfather's, uh, one of his drivers was the first fatality to oh, ever happen okay. at an NHRA event. Oh, uh, flywheel blew apart, cut the uh, fuel line, and the car burnt. And oh, he, uh, he was burned severely and then passed a couple days later in the hospital. But um, so they got out of it yeah. about that same time. And but you know, there was always race cars and old race car parts and such always at the house and I heard all the stories of how cool it was and so as I got a little bit older I met a friend Sam Wells everybody that's in the motorcycle world you knows Sam and Sam uh, he kind of took me under his wing and helped me with a first 
quasi pro stock motorcycle <laughs> that we built whenever he was with Motorcycles Unlimited with Carl Hoffelt there in Oklahoma City. Um, I lived in Oklahoma City at the time. So we uh, we built that and then we built a wow, we built a blown nitro funny bike. And I at the time I I'm about 138 to 140 pounds now. At that time, I was 125 pounds. <laughs> well, I had no business whatsoever being on a blown, big tire, funny bike. And it was the second or third pass that we made on that that it uh, it pitched me off. And oh, okay. I didn't ride a bike again for almost 10 years. But that was, you actually, um, you were injured when it's uh, right? You know, I, I, I did have to spend some, I had a little bit of internal injury, had to spend uh, okay. some time in the hospital, but no broken bones, just the broken spirit more than anything. Oh, okay. So, right. Now, when you get back into it, what, do you, what were you on when you got back into it? Well, it, it, several years later, I moved to Orlando, Florida, and for whatever reason, I decided I needed to go and buy the latest, greatest, whatever the Kawasaki Ninja was that was the, you know, the baddest on the planet at the time from the factory. And I took that motorcycle to the Orlando Speed World. And, yeah, I just wanted to see you know, how it would go. So they, they wouldn't let me just make a test run because there was an event going on. But they said, you know, for like 20 bucks, you could enter the, the uh, pro street or the street shootout, ET, whatever it was. You end up winning the event. Oh, geez. <laughs> so, I was hooked again. That was where it all started back up again. Now, um, obviously, you're in pro stock motorcycle now. So yes. I thought of a couple other questions, but we're going to kind of pull it in this way. Um, I question the pro stock motorcycle guys because you get a lot of this, like people give the Harley guys a hard time because they're racing this type of machine and they, they say, okay, well, what for you, for Chris Bostick, why pro stock motorcycle? Why do you love it so much? Because everybody, these guys are racing because they love Harleys. These guys are over at XDA racing pro street because they love that. Right. What does Chris Bostick love so much about pro stock motorcycle? I think. Probably what made me gravitate towards it is a lot of it to do with my size. I mean, at the time when I first got into Pro Stock back you know, late '80s, early '90s, I was I was the right size for it. I was 125 pounds, and then just some of my heroes that I watched, you know, Dave Schultz and John Myers and. Just you know, Terry Vance and Byron Hines and Matt Hines, whenever they were out there, and then Angel was coming onto the scene. It just, it was cool to me, and I just, I would uh, dream of one day, you know, how cool would it be to be on the same, you know, property and even possibly being able to be on the same drag strip with one of those guys at the same time. And so I just, I focused and I worked hard, and I, uh, I just. I I could see myself doing it, and if, if you, whoever you are out there that's listening, if you have a dream, if you can truly see yourself actually achieving that, you will do things by accident to make your dream come true. So I just, I saw a path and I, I just worked hard and I got into the car business and made enough money to where I could support it. What's your most uh, memorable race or experience? Oh, so as well, of as that of, really sticks out for you. Yeah, as of late, it was uh, whenever I first got back into Pro Stock Motorcycle. I didn't. Uh, whenever I bought my first dealership in Nashville, Tennessee, um, I had a business partner, and he said, "Chris, he said, I'm not going to partner with you and have my partner going 180 miles an hour down a drag strip." He said, "So you have to make a decision. You can make a really good living for yourself." being a partner with me, or you can go race that motorcycle. And so for 15 years, I didn't even sit on a wow. on a pro-stock motorcycle. But I sold the dealerships uh, in December of 18. And as I'm cleaning out some of my stuff, I find all this racing memorabilia. And I, I decided I was going to give it another shot. And so I ended up uh, contacting Greg Underdog and got relicensed. And I think one of the most memorable Things that happened as a as a play was whenever I made it all the way to the finals against Angel, my longtime friends and, and heroes, and, uh, was able to uh, you know, compete in, at that level and at that 
you know, in, in a final round, which yeah. is like really cool. <laughs> so that's my most memorable event as of, as of now. Oh, that's brutal. Now the um, now obviously we know this is a motorcycle drag racing in general, not just pro stock motorcycle, is dangerous. And you had the uh, occurrence in Darlington. So, Correct. Okay, where you had that incident. Um, for um, how how quickly do you bounce back? I mean, obviously, it's it's. I know a lot of people listening are going to already know the answer to this question. But for the people that may be new, um, how would you help them say, okay, well, things are going to happen. So how does Chris Bostick deal with it when it happens? Well, I believe in my heart that our time on this earth is numbered and it already is and I have a strong faith in, in God and I believe that as long as I'm doing the best that I can and doing it with the right intentions that God's going to take care of me so whenever that accident happened um, it actually I mean I was I was not on my motorcycle on it there's a lot of people that don't know this, okay. but I have a new motorcycle that's being built, and I had retired the motorcycle that I'm racing this weekend. Okay. The new motorcycle that is being built, I thought was going to be ready. It was not going to be ready for Las Vegas, and so um, Joey Gladstone and his the bike that he rode, and Corey Reed contacted me and they said, hey, we understand that you don't have a bike and we would like to offer you Joey's V-Twin that he ran uh, the previous year to, to take to Vegas and we'll, uh, we'll crew chief it for you. And what we'd like to do is before, you know, you get on it in front of, you know, the world on Fox television, <laughs> uh, let's go to Darlington or meet us in Darlington we're going to, to run. And so... We get there, we make, I make one half pass, everything's fine, and the first full pass I make on that motorcycle was a career best. I mean, that motorcycle is way newer and set up differently than the motorcycle I'm running now. The motorcycle I'm running now is a Cosman Gucci chassis that we struggled with, to be honest with you, and it's, it's a handful to ride. We, uh, I spent four hours yesterday at Chip Ellis' house we redesigned the exhaust system because the exhaust, the way it was, was pointing directly out of the left side in front of the crankshaft. So as you let go of the clutch, it's blowing the bike to the right. So we corrected that. The crash happened. It was it was devastating. I mean, I'm 61 years old, and whenever you go through the end of the quarter mile and 6.83 seconds at 195 miles an hour and then you're trying to uh, get the thing to shut down it was the first time i've ever been on the darlington track oh. after you know conversations with in fact with chip Ellis yesterday that's one of the tracks that he tests on often he said you have to come off the throttle relax for a second and let the bike travel about 400 feet as it goes over a a hill and starts downhill. Uh -huh. He said, if you get on the brakes before that, it'll wash the front end out, which it did for me. And then 20 minutes later, same thing happened to Dave Barron on his pro stop bike. So in my mind, it was not that, hey, I'm too old and that I shouldn't be out here doing this because I'm not talented enough to do it. It was me not being familiar enough with a track to uh, to understand how to drive the bike on that track, and so it was. It initially shook me, and I called my wife after I, you know, you gotta make, make sure, sure that, <laughs> that's the only race that we've ever been to testing or race that she was not at. And thank goodness she wasn't, because she would have freaked out. Yeah, but. Um, I called her up and said, she said, hey, so how's it going? I go, wow, we just made our very best you know, career pass. And she goes, oh, cool, so you all set for Vegas? I go, no, we're not going to be going to Vegas. She goes, well, why? And I said, well, the bike's broke. And she said, really? Did it blow up? I go, no, I uh, crashed. And she said, all right. And she freaks out. No, my God, I can't believe that. I but I had to have the conversation with her, so I didn't just call her. But hey, uh, I crashed the motorcycle on here because 
who knows what would have gone through her mind. Yeah. So at that moment when it first happened, um, I thought, mm, this is it. I'm going to you know, get rid of all this stuff that's kind of silly, um, <laughs> find something else that's not quite so crazy to do. But then as the day progressed and I started, you know, realizing that I'm okay and then unfortunately David crashed and I realized hey it's not just me it's like this, this crazy situation because he had never been on that track either. So to bounce back back to your original question um, it was the love of the sport the adrenaline that flows through your body whenever you make a pass and just the sheer desire and passion that you have for it and I've made literally hundreds of passes down the drag strip and I have crashed twice but it's not my time to go and I want to win a Wally so badly <laughs> and I have so much support from all of the other teams that are out here Jerry Savoy just this morning sends me a text message hey are you there please come by and you know, I want to visit with you and uh, Corey Reed and Joey Gladstone, they are offering their help. They're great people. I talked to GT Tama. He's, uh, he said that he's available to help. It's just Greg Underdahl, who's become one of my best friends, he and Gary Sofer, they, uh, they, anything that they see that could help me, they just share. Anything that I need, uh, I ask for help. Everybody has been more than gracious to do whatever they can to help help me achieve, you know, my dreams and goals. So. And it's it's and I see a lot of that over the years too. Is it, and it's it's not like somebody's doing it because they're they generally y'all generally care about each other. Racers genuinely care about each other. I mean, they I see y'all help each other at the drop of a dime. There's no hesitation to it. I mean, y'all are constantly there. So. Sure. Now yeah. don't take that the wrong way because whenever the competition's uh, different, stage light <laughs> comes on and those double amber hits, you are not my friend, nope. my brother. You are <laughs> going down. Yep. Now that's uh, that's always interesting, especially when you get the husband and wife duo. Uh, that just, sure. that's always an interesting one too because even in that case, nope, you're we're, yeah. we're enemies at that point until yeah. we're done. So yeah. um, now you're um. You made a comment earlier about the track, so it's. I think a lot of people do kind of um, maybe from. A, I know racers understand it, but maybe fans sometimes forget that the track has such. You, you've got to know the track. I mean, because this this track's going to be different than Atlanta. Sure. Atlanta's. I mean, I clearly you've got a driving situation on the track. Um, outside of Darlington, what was the most difficult? track that you had to, it could be an old one from your early days. Oh, what was yeah. the ugliest one you ever had to go down? Let's put it that way. <laughs> back, before, back before they resurfaced the Atlanta track, that right lane in Atlanta, it was it was almost to the point of where you had to drive around on the track. You leave the starting line and you go to the left, get close to the, if you're in the right lane, you go to the left, get close to the center of the line. And then just as you pass, you know, the 3.30, you better be getting back over towards <laughs> the wall or else you're going to hit another bump. So um, that track was, was a little scary. The, uh, one of the scariest things that happened, it wasn't the track, but it was back whenever we raced in Chicago, I had three bikes prior to the one that I have now, but I launched that motorcycle and the wheelie bar broke on one side, just not both of them, it didn't ground loop. Wheelie bar broke, and so the right side was still holding you down, and the left side is not. And so if you can imagine the motorcycle wanting to go straight up, yet roll over to the right at the same time, your you know, muscle memory from all of the days that I rode uh, motocross wow. came in. So, I mean, I clutched it and like, you know, threw it back down on the ground, to avoid a, a bad situation. Oh wow! Well. But yeah, the Atlanta track okay. was, was the rough one. That was a rough one. So, how y'all doing? I sorry for interrupting here, but I have to make sure that we give credit where credit is due. We're taking a short break to remind everybody that this session is brought to you by Pablo Gonzalez Racing. 
Pro Stock Motorcycle Team. He races Man Cup, XDA, and anything else. I think if you give the man a toaster, he'd probably race it. So Pablo Gonzalez Racing made this session today possible. With that being said, let's get back to our conversation right. with Chris Obviously, Boston. Obviously, the uh, four valve motor, yep. so Mitch Brown. Yeah. So, How's it performing for well, you? We've know, been paying attention. So we I, gotta uh, make sure we get Mitch a plug. Mitch is an amazing <laughs> guy. He's a, like a, a, he's a really close friend with Sam Wells. And so I developed somewhat of a friendship with Mitch as well over the last year or so. And uh, he's helping me with another project that's, that you want to talk about it, we will. But it's but we, all uh, up to you. Yeah, Do you want to yeah. tell us? It's up to you. It could be now feel, or next month. Yeah, we yeah. feel that the engine that that we have, mm -hmm. the head design that George Bryce and Mitch Brown came up with many years ago, this was just now approved. Back at the end of nineteen, whenever I got back into the sport mm -hmm. and I raced the U.S. Nationals in Indy, it was rumored that they were going to allow the four valve. Okay. for the 2020 season. Well, I contacted George Price, and George said that Mitch Brown had four or five of these heads that were that were CNC. They weren't finished. It would take you know, a lot of work to finish them, but he had four that he knew of, and that's all he was going to have until this was in September of 2019. That was going to be all that he was going to have until he started producing more of them in about February of the next year. And so I contacted Mitch, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to get the jump on everybody, right? <laughs> and so I contacted him, and um, I said, uh, George Bryce gave me your phone number, and, and he told me what he had, and I said, well, what do I need to do to, uh, to secure one? And he said, well, he said, the first person with money, you know, is... <laughs> I said, well, how much is it? He said, well, I need $2,500. And I'm thinking, wow, $2,500. bucks. i will take two. <laughs> and he goes, you want two? I go, yeah, just give me your PayPal account. And so I sent him $5,000. And I'm like, I've got two of the only four or five, so I'm going to get these and have, uh, you know, vowels put in them, and it's all going to be... Well, I didn't realize that the $2,500 was... <laughs> A deposit, <laughs> right, on the $7,500 per head, unfinished. <laughs> the silly things end up costing in excess of $20,000 yeah, to have it finished. And then you have to build a motor put under it, and then you can do it right is another point. But with the way that they designed it, now it's different from the Vance and Hines um, four valves because the uh, the Vance and Hines have, I think they're called finger followers, that is a different type of valve train, more like a, a car with like a rocker arm instead of a flat tappet that runs on the cam. So that's the biggest difference in them. However, I have not been able to show the racing world, Mitch, George, George Babor, um, what the head is really capable of doing. And the reason it has is, one, is because that motorcycle that I'm riding, that it's kind of a handful. And we just haven't been able to get an exact tune on it to make it work to its fullest potential. You know, it being a brand new engine, the first year that we had it out, we didn't realize that we were having a huge problem with valve springs. So we go out and we run 197 miles an hour in a field where the next fastest, not quickest, but fastest Suzuki was almost two miles an hour slower than us. And so mile an hour, in my opinion, and I, I'm a driver, not a not an engine builder, <laughs> in my opinion, mile an hour does reflect horsepower. And the ET is a combination of tuning the bike, tuning the clutch, making, you know, correct shifts, all of that. But once you get down the track, if you can you know, motor it up and get past you know, 197 miles an hour, and that's, that's going fast, and I believe that that's closer to what the potential of the engine has. So that's why we're really looking forward to a 
couple things. Getting the new motorcycle mm -hmm. that Mike Mullaney is building for us, and it is a twin triplet to the bike that Corey Reed and Joey Gladstone are running right now. Okay. And also is same design, same uh, high boost of body that Angel has gone 200 miles an hour with the first. And so we're really looking forward to having that chassis, that body, and the new engine, our, our new engine, our monster engine in it, just to see what the combination will do. And whenever I can ride it correctly and hit my shifts and stay tucked and stay straight and, and we get a good tune-up on it, um, I think it's going to be a very, very competitive engine. But we're still going to wait and find out. I mean, <laughs> Hats off to the Vance and Hines guys. They work extremely hard, and I hear so many people on the internet, oh, well, you know, they're, they've got an advantage, or they do this, they No, what they do is they work their asses off. They have a smart bunch of people at, at, at Vance and Hines, and they're dedicated, and they work long, hard hours to develop, and you know, they're not taking advantage or cheating or, or an edge or any, they just work. Like Matt Smith, Matt and Angie focus 100%. Whenever they wake up in the morning, they drink their coffee and talk about how to make their bikes go faster. I just know that that's, that's the people that they are. So I hope, I hope that I am able to make Mitch, George Bryce, George Baber, myself, my wife, everybody proud of what I believe that engine can do. So, very cool. Very cool. It's kind of cool to have the very first four valve on the NHRA track. <laughs> Got it first. Yeah. Hey, you had some first in the family. Might as well keep it going. That's right? true. So. so I have another first that's happening this weekend. So after the crash in Darlington, uh, the gentleman that helps me, who actually sponsors me for my leathers, NJK Leathers out of California. NJK. Yeah. Okay. Kelsey, Kelsey Gordon, great guy. He builds a lot of race suits for the GP road race guys and some flat track guys. Okay. Well, Kelsey and NJK Leathers, I don't know what NJK stands for, and so I created my own. So, Kelsey, <laughs> I apologize, but I'm calling them the no joking kind of leathers. They're the NJK leathers, and uh, they really did their job when I crashed in Darlington. However, I had to have a new set made. And so, whenever he, Kelsey, had been working with the GP road race guys, he also formed an alliance partnership with Alpine Stars, which is a, you know, boots, gloves, leathers, and Alpine Stars has been developing a airbag system. It's called Tech Air oh, that's cool. that the road race guys use. And they have a built-in computer system that's kind of in the middle of your back. Very small, very flat. It, when I put my new suit on, uh, you can't really tell that there's anything different about the suit. However, that suit has expandable panels in the shoulders, sleeves, chest area, to where this computer has 12 sensors, uh, G meters, accelerometers, all kinds of, of sensors that talk to the computer that's on it. And they've been developing this for more than 16 years for the road race guys. Wow. And the system can detect when you are crashing and once it says hey i'm crashing within 25 milliseconds it has two air canisters some type of a gas or air in it that deploys an airbag suit that goes from something no thicker than a heavy t-shirt to two and a half inches of solid almost turn you into like the Michelin tire guy a lot from your waist up over your shoulders and down to almost um, just past your biceps but the road race guys 
have they use the system have experienced a 97 percent reduction in broken bones such wow. as collarbones uh, broken ribs things like that same thing that happened to joey whenever joey gladstone crashed yeah. the next day after i did in darlington four broken ribs broken collarbone broken shoulder bone um, i can't say what would have happened if he was wearing the uh njk alpine stars equipped tech air system but 97 percent chance it it would have not broken bones had he been wearing it so they uh that's going to be a first to where we will have that you know the saying in any weight difference because of this added mm -hmm. technology how it's much more weight are you a talking little about? more than four pounds okay but we have to add 30 pounds to my yeah. motorcycle anyway. <laughs> so i'd rather you know maybe lose two pounds myself yeah. put four pounds on take two pounds off the bike um, that's a win-win especially if it makes you feel more confident let's make you feel more confident <laughs> The guy that I was, the gentleman that I was talking to from Alpine Stars said that their factory riders air tech system deployed 62 times last year. And my wow. initial comment was, man, sounds like you guys need a new rider. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of laughed and goes, yeah. He said, uh, you would think, but he said that the system said most almost all of the deployments of his system happened as he was testing, not at, in an actual race. Oh, okay. And he, he has so much confidence in the system, in the airbag system, in the suit that he's wearing, the safety gear, that he pushes his bike in testing past where he knows his limit is to see if he may have a new higher ceiling, a new higher limit, wow. knowing that if he goes down, chances are he's going to be fine, get back up. And so He can push that risk yeah. a little bit higher. Huh? So that makes me feel a little bit better and more confidence by getting back on the bike after, after it get off, as they say. Now, in the fitting process of this suit, is the fittings just still the same, or is there any extra considerations I got to Well, play? the different, you can't, it's, it's a vest system that zips into your leather jacket. Okay and you couldn't use it with your existing suit because your existing suit, it would try to crush you inside your suit. Oh, wow. That's why you have uh, the suit, the new jacket has the expandable joints or expandable panels that are in it that you wouldn't really even notice yeah. if, uh, if, you, you know, if it wasn't deployed. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you can zip the system out and wear the leathers and they're exactly the same as the first set of leathers that I got for it. So now, when it when it let's say an accident does occur, it does discharge. Um, as it, and are the leathers like useless, or do they like deflate it, or good how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Whenever it inflates, mm -hmm. um, unlike a car, an airbag in a car, as soon as it inflates, mm -hmm. it instantly starts going down. Okay. This, because you're rolling down the street, not just you know an, an impact. When it deploys and inflates, it inflates in 25 milliseconds, and then it stays fully inflated for one full minute. Oh wow! And then it takes four or five minutes for it then to let itself okay. back to where it was. Um, on a drag race suit, there you have to send the system back in just the not the whole leathers but you have to send the system back in they take and download from the computer all of the data from the crash they can make adjustments to the analytics to the suit to um, further develop and, and perfect their system okay. and then they put uh, they recharge it make sure that it's fine they test it and send it back to you so you can send it there overnight and have it back the next day damn that's cool yeah. that's cool now the um and the uh, you said it takes what like the one minute stays inflated for one and then goes down is the gradual decrease like a safety precaution in case there is something it kind of gives a little reinforcement to you is that the logic of a slow yeah. release that's a great question i'll ask it because i don't know the answer yeah. I mean, because my logic would be, okay, the, the EMTs and, or the EMS is going to get to you. Right. And it's kind of 
well, maybe it's designed to hold in place. It, uh, it, as long as you are still zipped up in your suit, mm -hmm. is now holding you in. Okay. As soon as an EMT gets there, if you're unconscious for whatever reason, yeah. or if you, you know, you get up and you're fine, unzip your suit. Okay. That's yeah, nice. and then and then it's not, you know, then you can take it off, gotcha. even though it's still inflated. It's not holding you. Okay. So they'll still be able to. It ain't gonna cause them any problems nope. treating you. No, instantly they can they can attend to you yeah. um, as they would it as if you didn't have. It. That is too cool. That is too cool. All right. Well, we are going to let this gentleman get back to work. And again, this isn't just one conversation. We're going to have more because the season's early. And uh, we'll, uh, of course, come back and revisit, talk more about the suit. So, and then as the new bike comes along, we'll right. talk more. Or we'll just come on here and pick on George. The only reason I say that is he's hiding in the background. He's watching the computer. He's <laughs> figuring out how we can go quicker and faster. So, George is a good guy. Yes, he so, is. So, so, yes. Hey, your daughter, Richard, George? Hey, yeah, George. Listen. Your daughter with you this weekend? No. No? No? Uh, so. Her boyfriend got in a real bad crash. At uh, oh, no. On the way to the track, right outside the track in South Georgia. Oh, wow. They had to cut him out of the car, and he he's screwed up. But she went to Indiana, mm. where he's from. That's where his doctors are and stuff. So she oh, wow. there. she's going to be up there for three weeks. Oh, my goodness. That's wow. what I said, because she works for me. <laughs> Wow. So she's going to miss testing and she'll be home for the next yeah. race. Well, uh, we love you, girl. So. <laughs> we'll throw that out there. Yeah, she's a good girl. Yeah. She's actually my goddaughter. She's, a, she's an amazing girl. Christine is, is amazing. Talented, for sure. All right. So I appreciate you sitting down with me today. Yeah. Um, but we'll have more conversations, I'm sure. Sounds good. Hey, all you listeners, stay tuned because I'm going to be meeting with Mr. Bob Blackwell this afternoon. And uh, there's another first that could be on the horizon. So s stay tuned to JT Podcast and uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Oh, maybe we can sneak in and be the first to hear it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Well, and you know. How y'all doing? I appreciate y'all sitting with me as I had a discussion with Chris Bostic, NHRA Pro Stock Motorcycle Drag Racer. Uh, Chris is a good man. Uh, he puts up with me and puts up with my mic over the years, and I'm honored to know him. Uh, him and his wife are wonderful, wonderful people. So is his crew, including George. <laughs> Gotta give George a push or a plug. And um, it's good to see his program heading in the right direction. So to be, uh, I'm eager to see what he does for the rest of the season. Now, as a reminder, as I always do, uh, Pablo Gonzalez Racing made this session today possible. So um, please support Pablo Gonzalez Racing at pg2racing.com. You can also find them on Facebook and Instagram. And he is looking for sponsors and partnerships for future NHRA events, not only this year, but next year as well. And that camera loves Pablo. Uh, Pablo has a unique strength for advertising because he pulls in two separate markets. He's a six-time Puerto Rican champion, and he's a six-time U.S. champion in various series. Um, he keeps getting better and better. I did do an interview with Blake Gon, which will be airing soon, where he discusses uh, the performance of Pablo Gonzalez Racing. He's every single pass, he's getting better and better. And uh, with your help, we can keep him racing and keep him in front of that camera because them cameras like Pablo, they're talking about him and they stay on him. So uh, there's a huge market advantage that he would bring to your company, to your brand, to your publication. Um, so Pablo Gonzalez Racing could use your help. Let's keep them racing. And I appreciate y'all for keeping up. Until next time, this is JT. I'm signing out, but I shall return. Thank y'all.